Children are sometimes rather guarded when they meet me. I've heard some say, how did he get out of the TV? <laughs> the San Jose Discovery Museum, the funny purple place, is an oasis in this kind of world, a temple of childhood. We say, let kids be kids. Cherish childhood and cherish the child. Wrap them in your love. Support their innate curiosity and support their goofiness. My husband pointed out seeing a kid leaning against the pins at the pin board exhibit. He backed into it, then turned around and looked to examine his own form in great amazement. We actually discovered a moment of self-discovery in that kid's life. At the Discovery Museum, the beauty of it is that when I was a kid, you would go and you would hang out and you would go into the museum and you would look around and you didn't see people of, of my uh, descent hanging at museums. Today, and knowing what the folks have done at, this, at the Discovery Museum and the outreach programs that they have, and the fight against obesity, and providing health care initiatives at the Discovery Museum, to me, says a lot about this museum. It's more. It's more than just a museum. It's a place where people can come and feel safe. It's a place where people can come of all colors and have a chance to feel like they can be discovered. I applaud all of you for doing what you do. Oscar, you're very negative. Yeah, I know, I like it like that. I, it's easy to think of how Oscar should think. He, it's the opposite of how I think you should be. That's why I've never liked you. <laughs> Oscar. Well, uh, there's a lot of people out there. Yes, and they've all, they're all here supporting the the uh, museum. Now you saw the museum. Yeah. Well, I, I hate to say this because it ruins my, my feelings about who I am, but I liked it. I feel a sense of responsibility to make sure that each and every child that is uh, touched in any way by my story understands that racism has no place in the minds and hearts of our children. No place. This core of laying a foundation for the future by working now to improve children's lives is something that is at the heart of the Always Dream Foundation. And its sole purpose is to embrace the hopes and dreams of children. And the Children's Discovery Museum shares this vision. It's the explorer's mindset, and it's a gift that your museum gives to each of these young adventurers. That mindset changed my life and has guided me ever since. Those of us who have chosen to work with children have a very special calling. Children bring their own life stories with them wherever they go. So what a difference you make. You who serve them and their families so directly. And children are very well served when they can come to believe that there isn't anything in their lives that can't be expressed in words or play or craft or whatever healthy way they happen to choose. I thank you all for adding so significantly to their choices such a gift 
will serve them all their days. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm Marilee Jennings, Executive Director of Children's Discovery Museum of San Jose. Thank you for presenting us with the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion and Access Award. It's doubly meaningful to receive this distinction in 2020 because it marks the 30th anniversary of our public opening. San Jose, California has been a minority majority city for nearly 75 years. So when our museum opened in 1990, our highest service priority was to reach all children in the community. For three decades, we have been on a journey to make the museum welcoming, relevant, and responsive to those in our own backyard and to serve the needs of new immigrants when San Jose becomes their home. Today, when you visit the museum, you are truly seeing a glimpse of the future. Children from diverse cultural backgrounds fill the exhibit galleries, learning and playing together and preparing to be the leaders and visionaries of their generation. We use cultural celebrations, trilingual signage, an open door policy admissions program, and a diverse staff as ways to invite the community to engage in the experiences we have to offer. We are proud to have parlayed what we learned over the years about serving our diverse community into a year-long professional development program for museums called CCLI in partnership with AAM, ACM, ASTC, and Garibay Group. Thank you for this deeply meaningful recognition and for the inspiration to continue the journey with the children and families of San Jose.
an energizing performance by Mariachi Mexico and such a fitting way really to kick off tonight's event celebrating our community's children and of course the essential role of music in all of our lives. Good evening. I'm Laura Garcia from NBC Bay Area's Today in the Bay. Anchor by day, but tonight, of course, your MC and host. And I'm really thrilled to be here today to serve as the MC for tonight's Legacy of Children's Award, the event all benefiting the place that we love, the Children's Discovery Museum of San Jose. I'm really excited to be here in order to support the museum as it's provided so much to me and my family, my triplets. We have so many fond memories of exploring, you know, the fire engine, playing with bubbles, and finding really one exciting thing after another. You can see my kids in some of these posts here. I mean, a lot of great memories were made there. It was fantastic. In fact, every time we drive by 87 and the big duck, they point it out and they say, when can we go back? Well, I hope it's soon. Because, you know, the museum has certainly been such a very big part of our lives, as I'm sure it's been for many of you as well. And I certainly wanted to participate in tonight's event to do whatever I can to make sure that the Children's Discovery Museum remains strong as they are certainly so committed to our community and keeping attendance low, keeping things safe until this children's vaccine is readily available to all the younger ones as well. I was excited to learn that in the year 2020, it actually marked the 30th anniversary of the museum's public opening. And it's such an important part to our community and what a great milestone that the museum has achieved. I realized then how much I believe that the children of this community, they deserve, of course, another 30 years. And of course, I'll do anything in my part to be able to help to make sure that that happened. And you know what? There'll be opportunities throughout the evening for you to participate as well and help out. Thank you to everyone, really, who's joining us tonight. This year's Legacy Awardee is Roberta Guaspari, the legendary viol violinist. She's the teacher and the co-founder of Opus 118 Harlem School of Music. And of course, through her amazing work of teaching violin to children in the Harlem public schools, she became an international figure in the fight for public music for all the education for low-income children as well and how important that it really is. Her story, in fact, was the inspiration for the Academy Award-nominated movie, Music of the Heart, starring Meryl Streep. You'll learn more about her as the evening progresses and, of course, about the Children's Discovery Museum's belief that the arts are really fundamental to the learning and lives of all children. There's quite a lineup of activities to engage you in, so really expect a fun and enlightening hour. 
First, we're going to hear from respected leaders about the Purple Museum's role in our community and more about the, what the museum has been up to during this big 13-month closure that we've been in. And then, of course, let the children's voices as well fill us with a lot of hope for the future. I'm Zoe Lofgren, representing California's 19th Congressional District. I appreciate the opportunity to join you virtually during your annual Legacy for Children Awards event and to congratulate you on your 30th anniversary. The museum is a cherished place for so many in our community. My own children visited the museum when they were little and now my grandchildren, twin boys, uh, come with me and their mother uh, to enjoy the museum. I remember when the museum was just a dream in uh, the 80s when we were all fundraising somewhere in front of the museum there's a brick with my name and my husband's name and, or my children's names and the community felt it was like raising the barn we're going to get this museum for the children of this community obviously important donors like Steve Wozniak and many others step forward. But really the museum uh, was uplifted by the hundreds and thousands of people in San Jose uh, who wanted this to be available for families. And the museum has served that purpose so very well. As we recover from the pandemic and we reopen after a year of distance learning and probably too much screen time, children need safe places like the museum where they can play freely and be curious. During the COVID pandemic, museums were hard hit. Now we're fortunate to have uh, the robust community in South Bay that comes together during challenging times. Just as when we created the museum, I know that the investments made then uh, will pay off for children this year and well into the future. As you know, Congress recently passed the American Rescue Plan and President Biden signed it into law. The plan includes a shuttered venue operators grant program, which will provide more than $16 billion in federal funding for local museums and performance venues. Please know that I will continue to support federal investments like this one that will help our San Jose community and most especially our children. I look forward to visiting soon with my two grandsons, and I know the next 30 years will be filled with even more fun and learning for San Jose's children and families. We thank you, Children's Discovery Museum. Sam Licardo, I'm the mayor of the city of San Jose. It's my great honor to celebrate with you the 30th anniversary of our cherished Children's Discovery Museum. This has been such an incredible landmark in the heart of our city for three decades now. And for generations of children, it has been a source of sustenance and inspiration. And I wanna thank each one of you, our incredibly talented staff, our board of directors, our many donors, all those who have been sustaining members of this incredible institution that has been so critically important for generations of our kids. I also want to congratulate and thank our honoree tonight, Roberta Guaspari, and all of those Legacy for Children Award winners who have continued to inspire us on our critical mission here at Children's Discovery Museum. We are proud to be a partner at the City of San Jose of the great work that you all do, and we look forward to 30 more years of tremendous leadership and inspiration for our kids. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening. I'm Marilee Jennings, the museum's executive director, and I sure wish we could all be together as we have been for so many years to celebrate the Legacy for Children Award. But this year has been quite a journey. It certainly wasn't the year we had imagined when on March 5th, 2020, the joyful noise of the Purple Museum turned into silence and our amazing collection of hands-on exhibits had no one to play with them. After 30 years of almost daily operations, we closed our doors to the public and would remain closed for 393 days. That feels like a lifetime 
to the little ones we serve. The profoundly quiet museum was scary and sad. There's no question that we were shaken to the core because everything we believe in, like hands-on learning in an immersive environment where the goal is to interact with others, just wouldn't work in a pandemic. We also said goodbye to the majority of our staff and to all of our dedicated volunteers. But parents kept reaching out for help with their kids who were now at home rather than in school while they were trying to manage their work demands also from home. And that's when we discovered a new path to serving the community and realized that very young children were in need of virtual programming designed just for them. Within weeks of our closure, we premiered the Virtual Purple Museum, offering online arts and science and even cooking workshops led by our staff who recorded them while sheltering in place at home using their cell phones. We even hosted our popular cultural festivals entirely virtually. We gained the most traction though with our story time and discovery time programs, which we offered in English, Spanish, and Vietnamese for ages five and under. Long-standing partners serving East San Jose children like Educare and Somos Mayfair also needed help for their families. And we responded by packaging and delivering individual kits filled with creative materials and then leading workshops with them using Zoom. At the same time, we stayed focused on making necessary changes to the museum facility and exhibits that would enable us to reopen safely. But we couldn't let go of hands-on activities because we know that kids learn best with their whole bodies. So we stayed focused instead on figuring out ways to modify experiences to support social distancing that even two and three-year-olds could handle. Now that the museum has happily reopened, we can see firsthand that children need hands-on engagement more than ever after a year of screen time. And they are so happy to see one another in the same space. It's still too soon to play together, but just being together, even six feet apart, feels really good. We are very grateful to the generous sponsors of tonight's event and are continuing our promise to the community to thrive so that children can once again play and discover in their own hands-on and minds-on ways. If you don't already know, we moved the very beloved Bubbles exhibit outdoors for safety reasons. But don't worry, we're creating a new exhibit in its place that will be equally fun and engaging. Just wait until you see this two-story airplay exhibit, fully powered with MERV-14 air filtration for safety, opening this summer. Thank you for standing by us and come visit soon. I'm Jan Arbanis a museum board member, co-chair for this year's Legacy event, and the mom of two boys who love the museum and have played in this very boat. I feel honored that so many of you have joined us tonight. Although the museum is back up and running, we are operating at a very low capacity in order to maintain social distancing for the safety of our visitors. The museum's normal financial model of 50% earned revenue through admissions and memberships and 50% contributed from the community simply does not work when we're only serving a small percentage of our typical audience. That's why the museum's board recognizes that now is the time to bolster our financial backbone and position the Purple Museum to be able to serve the community, whatever the capacity limitations may be, well into the future. As the theme of tonight's event reinforces, children need to keep on playing Unstructured play, like interacting with museum exhibits, is particularly important now after we've been pent up for months. It is through this type of creative expression that children learn to solve problems, make decisions, and communicate ideas. The board decided to double down on this year's fundraising goal so that the museum has the resources to respond to the learning and social needs of the community's children and families. But we need your help. 
We have set a fundraising goal for tonight's viewing audience that will help fill the earned income gap. We will be checking in from time to time to see how we're progressing. But please, feel free to start donating now. I'd also like to take a moment to thank some of the major sponsors of tonight's event. We are so grateful for our sponsors and their generosity and commitment to supporting our community. Now, let's meet tonight's Champion for Children major sponsor, Adobe. Hi everyone, my name is Kathleen Ramirez and I'm a board member at the Children's Discovery Museum and I'm Vice President of Finance and Business Operations at Adobe Systems. I have many cherished memories of my family at the museum and with Adobe's headquarters overlooking the Big Purple Museum, I have the pleasure of seeing children's happy faces as they arrive at the front door each and every day. Adobe continues to be a proud sponsor of the Children's Discovery Museum because we believe that creativity can change the world. By investing in community partnerships, we make life better in the places where we live and work. Thank you.
Wow, wasn't that an amazingly stunning performance? Thank you so much to the talented singers from the Cantabula Youth Singers of Silicon Valley and of course their artistic director, Yelena Sharkova. I'm so thankful that we have this innovative technology that is allowing these young people to continue to sing as a group and of course share all their amazing talents, even when they can't physically be together. The children's music was certainly so touching, so beautiful, going straight to your heart as well. And that is something the 2021 Legacy Awardee, Roberta Guaspari, knows quite well. The theme of this year's event is Keep On Playing, and that certainly has been Roberta's message to thousands of children in East Harlem Public Schools whom she has taught to play the violin. Roberta actually began her remarkable teaching career in three East Harlem public schools back in 1980. Through her work, she became an international figure in the fight for public school music education. In 1990, when funding for her teaching was eliminated, she didn't give up. She joined with parents, teachers, and other volunteers to continue that program. And they created a nonprofit organization now called Opus 118 Harlem School of Music. Her story, you may know as well, was the inspiration for the feature film Music of the Heart, where she was portrayed by Meryl Streep. What an honor there as well. Roberta believes that violin instructions can change her children's lives and that music education really remains the most noble of professions. Let's discover more about Opus 118 and Roberta's gifts to the world. I never would have had music if it weren't offered in my public schools. And I just feel like that was a real gift. And I think all kids should have it. Believe it or not, now, even now, still they're cutting music out of everything. My name is Emilia Smith. I am nine years old. I play two instruments. It's the violin and the cello. I like the cello because it's a low instrument. And I like string instruments, which have four strings. Opus 118 gave us access to um, music lessons that we would not have considered if Opus was not at our school. I've been a part of Opus 118 for 15 years now. Violin, I think it keeps you away from trouble because it's something you, you know, you have to put time, effort, and, you know, work into it. Some people don't get to play music, and I get to, I just feel proud. They learn to focus, they learn to listen, they learn to problem solve, they learn to memorize. They're learning a fantastic language so that they can have self-expression. I love Opus 118 because it makes me feel very proud. I learned a lot from Roberta. I've been observing her lately because, you know, I want to be a teacher. Opus 118 gave me an unforgettable journey. Opus 118 gave me music. I just want to say thank you, Roberta, for all that you have given me the last 20 years. I am proof that children succeed when they have a great support system by their side that care and believe in them. That is what I hope to show my students. Congratulations, Roberta, on this wonderful award. You deserve it. There's a new movie opening later this month called Music of the Heart. It stars Meryl Streep and tells the story of a dedicated teacher in Harlem. And it's based on the inspiring real life story of one incredible woman and the power of music. Your violin, Greg. Aim at me. On 116th Street in New York City's East Harlem, children are learning to play the violin. I want very smooth bows, you kids that are not beginners. Very legato. Since 1980, Roberta Gaspari has taught hundreds of children, children who have come to love the sound of their own instruments. When you play the violin, it feels so good. It feels like you're in a whole different world. 
The violin has taken these children to whole different worlds, worlds away from the streets of Harlem, where life is rich in musical tradition, but often poor in opportunity. It's taken them to Carnegie Hall, to an NBA game at Madison Square Garden. But best of all, to a place where they feel anything is possible. You get excited and you feel like you can do anything. Do you feel as if any child then could learn to play the violin, even if he or she isn't particularly mus musical? Well, I haven't found any children in over a thousand children that I've taught in my 20 years. I have not found one who is not musical. You know, if kids really try and, and are persistent, you know, they can learn to study the violin. They can learn anything. Uh, they, they need to, to believe in themselves. Is it exciting for you to see them grow and progress and to see how much pleasure their playing gives to them? I can't think of a it's, more fulfilling feeling. It's the best. It's really the best. I'm so proud of my students. But in 1991, her program was nearly decimated by public school budget cuts. So Roberta enlisted some powerful allies. I went and I watched her work, and I was just blown away with the unending enthusiasm, and most of all by this extraordinary ability, which I think she has uniquely, of getting into each child's head. So watch me, and I children know when they're being talked at and when they're being spoken with. And there's an enormous difference. It's the chance to make the kids feel, each of them, a person, that they are somebody, that they can do something by themselves, that they can actually do this, make a sound, look at each other, and do it together, and suddenly get out of that little horrible area of not belonging. Isaac Stern believed they belonged here, on the stage at Carnegie Hall with fiddlers like Itzhak Perlman and Mark O'Connor. An army of supporters then raised enough money to save their music program, a program which they all believe is a right, not a luxury. And the truth of the matter is that's not the way to fund arts education for kids. It should come out of public money and it should be mandated that it's there. But until it is, Roberta, like so many teachers, has to be resourceful to preserve her program. And the violin is the closest instrument to the voice. It's the one that sings closest to the voice. It can think of possibilities of life. And each child will learn either through the musical instrument or through another discipline how to look, how to feel, how to touch beauty. And that's what makes the difference. Good evening. I'm Kevin Chrysler, Chair of the Board of Children's Discovery Museum, and I have the great pleasure of presenting the Legacy for Children's Award 2021 to Roberta Gaspari. After hearing from children and adults in the Opus 118 video and Amanda's moving testimonial, it's so easy to see why Roberta was chosen as this year's award recipient. She has truly been unstoppable in making music part of children's lives in East Harlem. Since 1992, Roberta's violin students have played at the White House, Carnegie Hall, Yankee Stadium, Madison Square Garden, and on radio and TV. In 1993, a group of world famous violinists, including Isaac Stern, Itzhak Perlman, Arnold Steinhardt, and Midori performed with Roberta and her students on stage at Carnegie Hall. Says violinist Isaac Stern, the greatest wealth this country has is not a free market, it's free kids. This is our real wealth, our future. We should know how to invest in it wisely. Roberta Guaspari invests in the future by giving kids the gift of music, the feeling of success and confidence that they are more than capable of reaching the stars. The Legacy for Children's Award, established in 1999 by Children's Discovery Museum, honors an individual whose life's work has benefited children's learning and lives. 
The award itself is a sundial, symbolizing both how timely and timeless Roberta's impact is and the legacy she has created. It is my great honor to bestow the Legacy for Children Award 2021 to Roberta Guaspari. It gives me great pleasure to be with all of you tonight to accept this beautiful Legacy Award. Thank you so much, Kevin, and thanks also to the board and staff of the Children's Discovery Museum for giving my work this wonderful recognition. I'm very proud to join the distinguished roster of past Legacy recipients and will cherish my lovely new sundial. I have just the right spot for it in my garden in East Harlem. I was so looking forward to visiting San Jose and the Children's Discovery Museum to see for myself the beautiful facility you have created for children and the unique ways you encourage them to learn and explore. Playing a musical instrument teaches children how to focus, how to work hard, how to do something over and over and figure out how to make it better, to experience for themselves what it takes to make a beautiful sound, and most importantly, it gives these children the feeling of being proud of themselves and enables them to believe they can learn anything as long as they don't give up. And I don't let them give up. Our violin program doesn't just help the kids, it helps their whole families too. Each school year, almost 200 students, beginners and advanced, perform together in our thrilling end of the year concert. This concert is a very emotional event. For so many of these parents, it's their very first exposure to the beauty that their young children are able to create. At the end of the concert, so many parents have tears in their eyes. They simply can't believe their kids can make such beautiful music. So you can imagine how devastated we all were when I was informed in 1991 that due to budget cuts, our June year-end concert was going to be our last one and the violin program was being cut. We had over 150 children in the program by then, playing the violin beautifully and absolutely loving it. We just couldn't let this happen. So I rallied a local committee together, mostly made up of concerned parents, and we began looking for ways to save our violin program. We even landed a fabulous story right on the front page of the Metro section in the New York Times. Once this happened, journalists and reporters were calling us like crazy, wanting to cover the story. The first one was Maury Alter, a local TV reporter who filmed our class at the school, interviewed some of the kids, and then aired it the next day on the 5 o'clock and 11 o'clock news. And right there on the bottom of the screen for the duration of the entire piece was my home telephone number, the one I still have today. I'll never forget the next morning, which happened to be Mother's Day. I answered the phone and a loud, resonant voice bellowed, Hello, this is Itzhak Perlman. I was about as shocked as my sons would have been if Michael Jordan had called one of them. He continued, I saw your kids on the 11 o'clock news last night. They sounded great. What can I do to help? Come to our school, I pleaded come to our year-end concert, and he did. Shortly after Itzhak came to our school, Arnold Steinhardt of the Guarneri String Quartet and his wife Dorothea von Hoften came to the rescue. It was their idea to hold a benefit concert called Fiddle Fest at Carnegie Hall and to invite the greatest violinists in the world to share a stand with my students 
on that stage. This is why I've spent the past 40 years teaching in East Harlem public schools. And it's why I'm so appreciative of all the supporters, especially Arnold Steinhardt and Dorothea von Hoften, who came together to save our violin program. The extraordinary gift of support and visibility that they gave us saved the program for the nearly 2,000 kids who have passed through it and whose lives have been changed in such a positive way. Children everywhere, from San Jose to East Harlem, need the attention and love of caring adults, whether through a violin program or a museum created just for them. Being a violin teacher has been a way of expressing my spirituality. I believe we can touch the hearts and souls of children through the arts and must continue to fight for music and art to be a part of every child's education. So for me and all adults who work with children, thank you for this inspiring acknowledgement. I can't wait to see all the wonderful work you continue to do at the Children's Discovery Museum. Thank you. I feel very privileged to have a role in honoring you tonight, Roberta. You're such an inspiration and, of course, a great reminder of how important it is to give children this gift of music and to support them in all their creative processes as well. Thank you so much for accepting this special award and, of course, sharing your story and dedication with all of us as well. Truly inspirational. And thank you to the Children's Discovery Museum as well for finding all these amazingly special people in the world, truly making a difference in all of our children's lives. We're going to keep on playing tonight now with a violin performance by the classical hip hop duo Black Violin. Hold on to your seats, folks. <laughs> Children's Discovery Museum of San Jose. What's up? We are Black Violin. It is our honor and our pleasure to rock with you guys. Let's kick it off. This one here is one of our favorites. It's called Stereotypes. Hope you enjoy. Thank you. 
Wow, that was phenomenal. Hi, I'm Jeanette Calandra, a museum board member, the Other Legacy event co-chair alongside Jana. I'm also a mom of two girls, and when they were younger, we would drive 40 minutes to get to the museum as I loved to see their happy faces as they explored all around. I feel so inspired by tonight's honoree, and now very energized from that performance by Black Violin. I want to emphasize the importance of this year's fundraising. While we have all felt the negative impacts of the pandemic, the museum recognizes that some families have suffered worse than others, and we remain committed to maintaining our Museums for All reduced emission tickets for underserved families, even with reduced audience capacity. We also know that it may take some time for some families to feel comfortable venturing out into public places with their children. And we want to make sure that we maintain the programs offered through the virtual Purple Museum. The board feels strongly that we need to fund both in-person and virtual museum experiences for our children. And that's why we're asking for your help tonight. A gift of any amount will push us closer to our goal, and you can feel proud that your support is providing access to the children who need it the most. The museum has never been more committed to serving all children, and we need your help to get us there. I would like to take a moment to thank some of the major sponsors of tonight's event. We are so grateful to our sponsors and their generosity and, of course, their commitment to supporting our community. Now, let's meet tonight's visionary sponsor, Intuit. I'm Laura Finnell, a museum board member and Intuit's executive vice president, chief people and places officer. Diversity, equity, and inclusion are core to Intuit's values, and we passionately support Children's Discovery Museum's commitment to reach and serve diverse families in the Bay Area. We applaud how CDM is investing in helping children gain essential skills that will promote their success in school and one day in the workplace. This commitment goes hand in hand with Intuit's mission to change the trends of economic inequality by increasing the number of youth and adults who have relevant skills, by preparing individuals for careers, by bringing more jobs, and by supporting entrepreneurs, all critical to sparking economic prosperity. Let's take a peek at the fundraising thermometer and see what's been happening. In the meantime, please pull out your phone so you can make a gift. Well, it is so great to see so many names scrolling through and all those generous contributions coming in. Thank you so much. But let's keep on playing. First, we'll meet Dr. Michael C. Frank. He's with the David and Lucille Packard Foundation, professor of human biology at Stanford University. He and his students actively conduct research at the museum, investigating such topic as children's early development of language and how it interacts with their developing understanding of the social world. He's 
is going to help us understand why play is so important in children's healthy, emotional, cognitive, and social development, and why it's even more important as children are emerging from all this isolation of the pandemic as well. Then we're going to get to put our hands to work and have a little fun. This is when you're going to need that purple bag that was sent to you in advance, or you may find the items listed on the museum's website as well. Keeping with the musical theme tonight, we're going to learn to make and play an indigenous musical instrument called the rain stick out of everyday materials. My kids are going to be gathered around to help as well. So let's get started. Hi. I'm Mike Frank, a professor of psychology at Stanford University and the director of our symbolic systems program here. Thanks very much for giving me the opportunity to talk to you about my relationship with Children's Discovery Museum. I've been working with the museum as a researcher for over 10 years. One study we did in partnership with CDM used head mounted cameras to capture the experience of exploring the museum. Here's just a little bit of that video. I'm also connected with CDM as a parent. I've been taking my children to CDM since they were born. I brought my daughter Madeline, who's now seven, as soon as she could walk. If you've been to CDM, then I'm sure you know the fire engine that's parked in the entrance hall. When she was little, Madeline loved that fire truck. She'd run up and down it over and over, putting on her helmet and spraying pretend water everywhere. For me, that fire engine illustrates what makes CDM special. The museum takes the world outside, which is big and fast and scary, and not always appropriate for kids to play with. It takes that big outside world and it slows it down, lets you climb up on it and try on its clothes. You can be the firefighter, and maybe your parent is on fire. Maybe they need to be put out. I'm sure I don't need to remind you how important play is for young children. Our best understanding of how children learn is that they're like little scientists. And just like scientists, kids are building theories of how different parts of the world work. Play is the way they do experiments. By fooling around, banging, dropping, and throwing things, they're learning a kind of baby theory of physics. Or by playing pretend, they're practicing their theories about other people's minds. All this reminds me of one of my favorite books, How Tom Beat Captain Najork and His Hired Sportsman by Russell Hoban. The protagonist, Tom, defeats a whole gang of hired sportsmen in complicated games like Muck and Womble because he spent his childhood fooling around and learning the skills he needed to succeed by dropping things into the water off bridges or making giant towers out of barrels. Of course, it's important to learn academic skills as well, but informal play-based experiences provide a solid foundation of observation and experience that can support children as they learn scientific principles once they go to school. From creating wonder at a floating ball to unearthing mammoth bones, the museum allows children to explore the world one experiment at a time. Alongside all the huge effects of the COVID-19 pandemic, one of the smaller but still consequential ones has been the way that children's world has contracted their opportunities for play. My son Jonah is just older than two now, and he has been watching fire trucks outside our house at Stanford for the past year, playing firefighter on the patio. But opportunities to get up close and personal with the real thing have been very limited because the pandemic started only a few months after he learned to walk. I was so excited then that with the first reopening of the museum last month, Jonah was able to climb up on that wonderful fire engine and spray his burning parents. I'm looking forward to many more years of partnership with CDM in the future and many more visits with my family. Thanks. Hello, my name is Ruben Colon. Hello, my name is Patita Diacolón. And today we're going to show you how to make your very own rain stick. We will also tell a little bit about the history of the rain stick and share some ways that you can actually use your rain stick at home. In many cultures, calling the rain often included the use of musical instruments. And one well-known example is the rain stick, an instrument that mimics the rain. The origin of the rain stick is not fully known, but many people think that it probably came from a group of native people known as the Diagita, people from the deserts of northern Chile. And here, closer to home, I'd like to mention and recognize a group of people that live and work in our communities from the area of Oaxaca, where my wife is from. And there live the Mixteco people, and they call themselves the Nusavi, people of the rain. And to them, 
the rain was so important in their daily lives because they depended on the rain for their food and agriculture. One way that you can use your rain stick is just by joining in music that you hear. You can shake your rattle, you can use it in different ways to accompany the music that you hear around you. So before we get started, let's look at the materials that we will be using. These are materials that are in the Keep Playing kits, but some of you may have gathered some of these materials on your own. First of all, we have one cardboard tube. We also have two end caps, aluminum foil, one bag of navy beans, one bag of lentils, a bag of rice, one glue stick, two feathers, six pieces of yarn, three strips of construction paper, and two strips of patterned paper, one keep on playing sticker, and one white sticker. And these are the materials that we will be using today. Now we will go over the instructions for making our rain stick. The first thing that we are going to do is we are going to make the internal apparatus that's going to make the sound of rain. So in your packet we have three pieces of aluminum foil. What you will do is you will fold the aluminum foil into a triangle. Aluminum foil into a triangle. And for about a half an inch, we're gonna fold the foil in a little strip. Fold the foil in a little strip. And once you have it in a little strip, you could kind of crunch it up in your hands. What I like to do is roll it a little bit in my hands to make it a little bit stiffer and have like this aluminum foil little rod here. Now, so you can twist it like this. So I'm going to make two more so that I have a total of three. And there we have our three pieces of aluminum foil that we will use to braid our internal apparatus. So here what we are going to do is we're going to join the three ends of the foil and twist together the ends. Twist together the ends. And we are going to braid these three pieces of aluminum foil together as if we were braiding. Like this, one over the other one. Once you come to the end, the other end of your foil, you're going to twist those ends so that way they stick together. So they stick together. Once you have it like this, we are going to open up the little spaces and see how I'm making it kind of round. That way when I put it into my cardboard tube, it's kind of in the shape of the tube itself. That way, our little pieces of rice, or lentils, or beans can kind of fall through there. So once you have your foil braid like that, it's a braid. we are going to get our cardboard tube and one plastic cap, and we are going to cover one end of the cardboard tube. We need a little bit of pressure to get that cap in there. Only one side. Just one side. Once you have that covered on one side, you are going to insert your foil apparatus into the cardboard tube. And now we are ready to pour in some of the rice and lentils. But here we have a piece of paper and a white sticker that we will be using to make a funnel. So I'm going to, we're gonna to work together here and I'm going to make a funnel type cone shape. Open a little more. Yeah. Okay, open it up a little bit more there and I'm gonna put the sticker here so that way it holds my funnel into place. 
hold it like this. So I'm going to put a, about half, maybe a little bit more than half of the rice. Oh wow, I can already hear the rain. And I'm going to put the lentils in. And it's up to you how much of the lentils, how much of the rice you would like to put in. And I'm going to put in about half of the beans that are in my package. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to test it to see how it, to hear how it sounds by covering one end with my hand and turning it over. I'm going to do the same. Okay, I think I like the way the wine sounds. Like this. And some base. Once you've poured the amount of rice, beans, or lentils into your rain stick, you're going to use the other cap end and put it into place. How about the other side? Put the cup. So now we've constructed our rain stick and the next step would be to decorate it. At this stage, your rain stick is complete and ready to use. However, if you would like to decorate it, We've included some materials here in the packet so you can decorate your rain stick. We have some construction paper in different colors, some pattern paper. You could also use pattern paper that you have at home. You could use yarn and feathers uh, to decorate your rain stick. And you could also put different stickers like this keep on playing sticker that we've included in your packet. So here we have some different examples of rain sticks that we've decorated. This one has the keep on playing sticker and some feathers and yarn. Some of these have glitter. Be as creative as you'd like when you decorate these rain sticks and personalize them to make them your own. So here are a couple ways, techniques that you can use your rain stick and make different sounds. First of all, I'm going to gradually extend the sound of rain as if it were like sprinkling. Or you can just turn it right over and make the rain very sudden. I like to use the rain stick as a shaker, so I use them to create rhythms like this. Or they can also be used like rattles. As you're practicing playing your rain stick, let's check in on our fundraising thermometer and find out what's been happening.
Well, that was certainly fun, a great way to spend some time with my kids. And also the Children's Discovery Museum wanted to take a moment during tonight's event to honor Bill Sullivan. He's a longstanding board member and major donor who recently retired from the board. If the name Bill sounds familiar, it's because the beautiful outdoor play space called Bill's Backyard. It was named to honor him. Hi, my name is Dan Amond, past board chair of the museum's board of directors. I'd like to take a moment out of tonight's legacy event to honor a very important person in the history of the museum who recently retired from the board of directors. In the last 17 years, Bill Sullivan has had a tremendous impact on the museum. He gave generously of his time, talent, and treasure, all with the singular purpose of keeping the museum heading in the right direction. Bill has been a mentor to me both directly through our conversations and indirectly by my observations of how, when, and why he chose to speak up at board meetings. Bill was uncanny in his ability to focus the board in a direction that led to successful outcomes. Whether he was reining us in when we had grand visions that may not be achievable given our resources, or whether he was encouraging us to go for it when it was time to go big. I will miss Bill's opinions of one in the board meetings, but know that we'll still be friends outside of these purple walls. Without any hyperbole, I can say that Bill's impact will last for generations, perhaps nowhere more poignantly than right here in the outdoor play space named in his honor. Bill, thank you. We know we will see you and your grandsons around the museum. Tonight's event has been filled with such amazing, great people who have done amazing things for the kids as well. It's also been such a fun and educational experience with Children's Discovery Museum really knowing how to make learning fun. And it was great to experience all of that with you as well. As we finally draw this evening to a close, please take a moment to perhaps give a donation to the campaign. Let's all rally together to really meet that goal. It's been a wonderful evening sharing with you. Thanks so much for including my family as well and giving us the opportunity to really reminisce a little bit about our wonderful times that we spent at Children's Discovery Museum and all the visits that we paid there over the years. Best wishes to the museum for the next 30 years as well. And now, more from Black Violin. Once again, thank you CDM for having us. We are Black Violin. The song is called Impossible is Possible. Clap your hands like this, come on. Fire. Oh, 
guess we could The sun and world, the impossible is possible The sun and world, the impossible is possible Hey There's a moment when you understand You don't gotta follow all the plans You gotta open up your hands Don't leave it up to chance You can do anything, come on Sound like the sun, the moon, the stars We can go anywhere They see us no matter where we are Hey, cause we got the fire Yes we do Hey, cause we got the fire Oh, yes we do Care Marcus, talk to him So the world, the impossible is possible. So the world, the impossible is possible. So the world, the impossible is possible. It's up to us to show the world the impossible is possible. Hey. You can do anything We shine like the sun, the moon, the stars We can go anywhere They see us no matter where we are Hey, cause we got the fire huh. Yes we do Hey, cause we got the fire Oh, yes we do Thank you. Drum roll, please. for your generosity. On behalf of the Board of Directors of the Children's Discovery Museum of San Jose, thank you for investing in the museum and our community's children. See you next year at the Legacy for Children's Award 2022.